much for making time for this session. I'm Kipto Chemoiwa. I'll be your host. We have specific objectives for this session. The first one being how youth and women can be meaningfully engaged in restoration activities. And we also want to see uh, this youth and women who are in the forefront as far as restoration is concerned. And also we want to showcase the opportunities for youth and women also in restoration. And also we want to highlight the challenges as well as the bottlenecks uh, when we talk about restoration that this uh, women and youth are engaging in. So when you talk about restoration, uh, more than often, more than not, we have a lot of uh, youth and women that are engaged, especially in the, in the grassroots levels. We have a lot of women and youth that are engaging in restoration, and that's why we are having this session. And so uh, we're going to be having two titles that we'll be talking about today. Uh, the first one will be the youth and women representation in decision making, uh, as far as restoration is concerned. And then the second session, we're going to be talking about restoration opportunities. And so we are having, a, having amazing speakers today. Uh, youth and women who are engaging in restoration and also those who are in decision making process. And also we're going to be having breakout rooms. We're going to be talking about intergenerational dialogue on youth and women engagement. And this session is going to be moderated by John Kimayo. Thank you so much. For this plenary, we are going to discuss how well women and young people are represented in decision-making processes, decision-making processes which are linked to a restoration projects. So we will focus on the importance of their representation, uh, the representation processes and the challenges that they face. So Milton, what are the challenges that youth face when it comes to participation and engagement in decision-making processes linked to restoration, that is the policy making and design and implementation, monitoring and benefit sharing of the restoration projects. Thank you so much, June. And I would also like to thank uh, the team who has actually worked so hard to make sure that this event is here today and also all the participants. Okay, thank you so much. No, it is um, quite a very tricky discussion today when you talk about the challenges young people are facing because it is true they are there and there are multiple challenges which young people are facing when it's come to land restoration and even the existing opportunities. And the reality is now every youth by the virtue that they are Kenyans is coming from a devolved unit, that's the county government. And you realize that sometimes it's true, there's a, there are a lot of challenges we face as young people and the first, is probably within the government and second could be within ourselves because they say sometimes information is power. And uh, the real challenge we are facing when we do we engage in restoration activities, when we engage with the government based on the practices we, we engage in on the ground. First, it's true government, the priority of government is to you know, offer conducive environment whereby all players can feel they're uncomfortable with what they're doing. And this good playing ground will definitely come when there are the right policies to enhance youth participation in this own making and engage in best practices so that what they are doing will also be backed by the existing policies. And the question we really need to ask ourselves is how many default units, the 47 of them, have these good policies which could engage women, which could engage the young people. If we start of the recent, when it's come even to the climate change policies and the climate change regulations, how many counties already have enacted their bills into laws and how many counties already have their climate change policy into existence? Because it is through the policy whereby now they come with the fund regulation to actually fund locally led initiatives whereby even young people and our women can actually be engaged in such opportunities. But if right now, nine years or eight years down the line, since the evolution started and still some counties have not actually come up with appropriate policies to engage our women and to engage young people, then it is still a milestone actually to tap into the devolved unit opportunities, which can enhance their rightful participation and involvement in decision making because because we don't have all this regulation and policy into existence. Reason why I'm, I would really emphasize when it's come to climate change policy and the climate change fund, if you check the, the structure of the climate change fund regulation, you realize that there are so many opportunities which comes as a result of this. One is 
participation based on the various policies existing committees which are there because when it's come to climate change board the steering committee we have technical committee and it's cascaded down to the world climate change council down the level so this offer opportunity for even women to be represented in the decision making and actually to keep the track and check of the devolved governments, how do they allocate resources to locally led initiative or best practices within the community level? And what are the youth representation within these committees in terms of gender? What is the representation? And can we keep check and balance when it comes to you know, utilization of the resources? So one of the challenges to summarize is one, we don't have a very few counties already have existing policies and the regulation. That could be one. And if it is there, it could offer an opportunity for young people to be represented. It could offer an opportunity for funds or resources to be pumped to implement locally led initiative. And one of them could be initiative which actually involves land restoration and could lead to climate change adaptation at the community level. And this offer also opportunity for our women and for our youth. Secondly, the second challenge which young people could be facing is sometimes it is actually, you know, it takes the person that you have actually to say, I want to get the right information. Because if I get the right information, I can really engage people constructively rather than making noise. And this comes as a result we really need to know how do we engage county government, the devolved units, when it's come to budgetary processes? Because I only know your intention when you show me your budget. When the government makes the budgetary process, that is when we know the priorities of the government and the intention of the government. And it cascades to the county government level. When we know when do they start their budgetary processes and how can we get involved as young people or as women within the, the world level, even at the county level because budgetary process start at the departmental level and it cascade to the world level and what are the key budget documents we really need to get so that we start interrogating and advocate so that there could be a lot of resources or we tap into the opportunity with the available resources and we push so that our ideas our projects could actually be incorporated within the budgetary allocation within the devolved government. So it is very, very much important to know when does the county start their budgetary process? And if we are, want to get involved ourselves into this, what are the key budget documents we really need to, to, to get hold of? And what are the key, key persons or key stakeholders within the county government we really need to engage on? Because with the budget, it starts from the CIDP, the County Integrated Development Plan, which is a five-year plan which every county really needs to have right now. Secondly, the CIDP should be broken down into annual development plan. That is the ADP, which is an annual plan which the county have with the plaque from the CIDP. Then it cascades to the county fiscal strategy paper. Then there will be county, you know, budget outlook and review paper. And we will also be having the budget estimate. So it's about when do, do they start the process and who calls for. You can only get this information through the county website or through the access to information now. The county, they don't actually advertise. If it, they do advertisement, then you realize that it is on the unpopular daily magazine or the newspapers. It, it could not be on the standard. It could not be on the daily nation. It could be hiding somewhere there. So for us to get access to the information when they are going to start the process is a challenge. At the same time, for them to update their website, because of late, we can get information anywhere, so long as you have your smartphone and you have your data bandage. So updating the information on their website is also a challenge. Because because you really, if you go to most of the counties and you check their website, the only document you can get is from the 2018 documents. You can hardly get the document from 2020. And that tells you there could be a problem. There's something probably they could be hiding from us. I'm not sure. But if we can update our website so that the public could get access to the right information, then we can do the right advocacy and channel our grievances within that processes. So 
in a nutshell, two things very important. One is engagement at the policy level because the government will tell you with us, we just offer a conducive environment and conducive environment could only be offered through the policy process. Secondly, is on a budgetary process. What are the key documents and what is our goal when we want to get involved in the budgetary processes within the government? So at the county level, I strongly believe these are the challenges young people are facing to get involved in the decision making within the devolved units of governance. Thank you. Thank you so much, Milton. I really, you really uh, touch upon everything. And uh, when you say that we are also a part of the challenge because we as young people are not interested really in understanding the budgetary process. What about you, Grace? You've been working with communities and, and, and young people from the communities. What do you think are some of the challenges that these young men and women and in, in this community space when it comes to uh, participation and engagement in decision making, which are linked to the uh, restoration of projects and processes. Grace, welcome. I'm Grace Munga from Kilifi. I'm the chairperson of Mutakimau CFA. I deal with women and youth. The challenges we have are facing the women in our community is the culture because the people on the ground believe that women are not supposed to be leaders. They still believe in that. Every time we want to do something, they want to, we, we see men coming because they don't believe that we can, we can do it on our own. At least for now, we have come up with the strategies which we come together as women and we have tried to make our own decisions. We implement some projects which uh, they are seeing them now and they believe that women can really make it. Other challenges which, which women, I don't know if I call it suffering or the challenges, the forest which we, we are dealing with is a marine ecosystem. And you know, it's like not, it's not like a terrestrial forest. So it's uh, most of the time it's really hard, but we are, they are, the, the, the women around here have made it because most of the time we have to get at least a boat which we can maneuver into the mangrove forest. And because uh, we have come down to work with many, many ladies and the youth, we usually make it to where we are supposed to plant or to make the project. And uh, we, have, we have made it, at least we are doing restoration where they have uh, spoiled the, the, the trees. The county government, as uh, Obote has said, it's really true because uh, the county governments, the national government, they are not uh, advertising for, ev for everybody to see. They call us in their meetings when they have their CIDPs, but if you go there, they have already made, they, they have a mind on the projects they are going to, to help. And it's not for the whole financial year. You are just given uh, something small which cannot make you continue with the project. So we have to be going to other venues. But if the county government, especially here in Kilifi, if we can be, we can have the access to information, it would really help us. We can, we are not getting the right information. The information which we get is most of the time is stale. It has already passed is when we are, we are getting it and it doesn't help us much. So because of the social media, sometimes we get it through other people who are in the county government and they are seeing things are not right. So they, they put it in social media, but they have to have a way which we can, we can be together and uh, they have to come to us as women and youth that we can work together. On benefit sharing, the projects which we usually have, even if we work with the county governments, they want to get the, the bigger share because they think the communities don't know anything. So what uh, we, we can do with the, with the uh, benefit sharing also with the strategies where, where we can impl implement as women so that we participate together with the county government and we come down, sit together and see how we can do it. Most of the time, we are not in the picture. It's, it's not really good. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much, Grace. Masi, what, what do you think are some of these challenges that women face when it comes to participation and engagement in the restoration project? I want to say that uh, the Green Belt Movement is doing uh, a great job in uh, radscape restoration. 
We are building back better uh, through uh, degraded landscapes restoration. And uh, I just want to say that in 2016, uh, through the Ministry of Environment, uh, the Green Belt Movement was involved in um, mapping the restoration potential for Kenya. So that is a document that is out there that highlights uh, the hotspots of where we need to mobilize resources and uh, uh, engage in massive restoration for us to go back to, to where the ecosystems were in terms of achieving our national target of 10 a percent tree cover. So, and to highlight uh, some of the challenges, because for us, we work with the women since 1977, for the last uh, 40, 44 years, we have been empowering communities to do environmental conservation, uh, to also uh, improve livelihoods. And through tree planting, there's a very strong uh, linkage or connection between environmental conservation and livelihood improvement. And one of the challenges that is very, very critical is access to the information and right information. Like I said, we already have mapped the potential, the restoration potential for the country. But un until that kind of information is packaged in a way that a grassroots woman when it is presented, understands which are the areas they can engage and take action and how they can do it and for how long and who do they work with to ensure that at their level, they are able to make decisions on how to raise the seedlings for planting, where they will get the seeds, but information must be packaged in a way they are able to, to have access to it so that they can make meaningful decisions as far as our restoration is concerned. And another area that is very, very interesting that I need to highlight is the cultural barriers, especially from our pastoral communities. Uh, we had a program in, in Saburu County and uh, we, were, we, we wanted to work with the women. Uh, we were mobilizing the women to, to, to plant trees in their, in their forest, uh, to plant trees on their farms. Uh, we also wanted them to have small kitchen gardens in their households, uh, but there is this council of elders. Uh, it is a barrier that we, you need to use a lot of wisdom. Uh, 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 you need to really find a way how you will get through that barrier. Uh, and what we did for them to allow the women to come for a meeting here in Arab so that we could do the demonstrations on the various interventions they needed to implement. Uh, they said that we, the men had to come first uh, so that they can see exactly what we were, we were putting their, their women through. They thought they were coming to do other things that are not really around within their culture. And they came. We, we, we mobilized all the, the members of, of the areas where we were, we were planting, we were planning to plant, and we brought them in, in our Rangata Training Center, and we took them through the GBM 10-step watershed-based approach. We highlighted some of the intervention that we will be able to, to, to implement and how the, the communities will benefit. And at the end of the workshop, that is when they said, now we are okay, we understand, now the women can come. So it you, you, you understand now that kind of a barrier involves resources, involves a dialogue, and in a way uh, that they understand it is for their own benefit. It will benefit the community, it will benefit the stakeholders, it will restore their ecosystem so that they can continue giving water, they can continue protecting the animals inside and sequestering carbon and so many ecosystem uh, ecological services that are critical uh, for every forest that we have in the country, especially the major water tower. So that was one uh, of, of the barriers that uh, if we are not careful, it can hold people back, it can prevent women it can prevent the, the young girls, it can prevent the young men and girls and, and women from achieving uh, uh, so much uh, that they have potential for. But because of culture, uh, it, it really limits uh, how much they can achieve and how far they can go. And again, those kind of ecosystems, if they are not carefully addressed, uh, they will run behind because of the cultural, cultural barriers. Uh, the other one, it's normally very interesting. When you call for community meetings, uh, if you haven't really done proper mobilization, you will have very few women attend. So limited participation of women because they have so many other engagements can really affect their involvement in some of these uh, decision-making processes that are affecting their lives. Sometimes you need to do a lot of community empowerment. Uh, you really need to, to ensure that you bring the women and you even follow them 
where where they are so that they can be able to 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 engage uh, and to be able to come for meetings when you call and when you call for the meetings when they come they don't keep quiet they are comfortable to speak out their issues even when they have men in their meeting and the other thing that i found working very well uh, and it is not there in every county is public participation on, on when, when county governments are developing uh, documents, is it a policy, is it a legislation, it need to be brought back to the people for them to give input. But for women to be uh, engaged meaningfully, they need to understand that document. But if that participation doesn't happen or it happens and they are not involved again, that is an area uh, that the, the women are left out and they are not able to give input, uh, especially in areas that are affecting their lives. And we know women are the corners. They keep our families going and they have so many things to attend to, to make sure that their, their families have food on their table. Disempowerment. Uh, disempowerment is another area that is really affecting our women, our youth. Uh, and, and we all know that information is power. When you take a girl to school, uh, you know she has every chance, like a boy child, to compete for jobs, to compete uh, in, in school, uh, and, and to compete in sports, but they need to have the information, they need to be educated, so that they have a platform that is that is uniform and that is uh, like for the others. Then also lack of resources, uh, be it finances, uh, be it land, there are so many issues around tenure that really are limiting women and, 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 and youth to achieve so much, uh, so that is another Another area that is uh, really affecting uh, their involvement and their lack of access to areas where decisions are being made. The other one is lack of feedback mechanisms. We have university students who are collecting information on different problems that are affecting our society, be it energy, be it uh, participatory forest management, be it climate change. But once the thesis are done, the, the students never go back to give feedback. When researchers do their research, they never go back on what the findings are and what needs to be done to solve those problems. Those documents either arise somewhere in a library or in an institution or uh, shelves, and it is very good information, but it needs to be unpacked and brought back to, to the community uh, for them to, to be able to, to give input. Uh, the other one that I find uh, really, or, or the Green Belt Movement find it very challenging, is the top-bottom approach. When so much is happening at the national government, when so much is happening at the county government, and doesn't trickle down to the communities whom are expected to take action to plant trees in the forest, to plant trees on their farm, in our constitution, every farm or every household, part of your farm, it's supposed to be 10%. You have to plant trees, 10% of your land is supposed to be uh, trees. But that kind of information need to be brought back in a way they understand that you are not taking away their land or you are not really booking their land for life and they won't be able to grow food. Uh, so some of these things is the top bottom approach isn't really working when it comes to restoration uh, and, and massive restoration and to get where we want to be. But we need to embrace bottom up approach uh, where communities who are being affected by the global challenges around climate change, around floods, uh, lack of firewood, lack of water, Water, the outcry in Mount Kenya in 2018 brought about the task force to address issues around forest conservation and management. And we, we came up with very good recommendations that are being implemented. But we don't have to wait for problems and for communities to cry out for us to take action. In every county, we have a climate change action plan. At the national level, we have a climate change action plan. It has very clear mitigation actions. It has very clear adaptation actions. It has very clear monitoring framework. It has very clear what every sector is expected. But how many of the women in the rural areas know those documents exist and how they can help to meet the targets in those documents? That information is not there because, again, it is top to bottom, not bottom up. And, and those are some of the, the things I would like to, to highlight. And, and just to say that um, to address the challenges that we are facing as a country, we have the UN Decade for Restoration. We also have the Asho Prize. It is also a global award. And it is also for 10 years, just like the UN Decade for Restoration. And we are looking at solutions, we are looking at in innovations that are game changing, that are, that are impacting on human and environment, that are mm -hmm. breakable, that are scalable around 
protect and restore nature, clean our air, uh, revive our oceans, build a, a waste-free environment or world, and fix our climate. And the Green Belt, as a nominator, is looking for these solutions across, either it is the businesses or individuals or farms or government. But we need to bring the information to the, to the people who are being affected uh, because women and children and youth are very vulnerable so that they can be able to bring out because they have the solutions. They have been doing this, so many things, nature-based enterprises, that they can be brought to these particular platforms uh, for global uh, winning uh, kind of award. So thank you, June Bakte. Thank you so much, Masi. I, I really uh, was interested in the part where everyone just mentioned that the information and the right information is one of the biggest problems and that, that, that women and young people are facing. would like every one of you to take at least two minutes to just mention the opportunities. So Grace, welcome. Thank you. Uh, the opportunities which we have from uh, our side is at least we do tree nurseries and then the, uh, the seedlings which we get from doing the nurseries during the season when we are planting the county government at least buys from us. So at least that is an opportunity for us. And we also have other organizations who come to, to buy seedlings from us. So at least uh, we have uh, days in our week, in, in one week, where women go and they, they collect seeds and other days we do the plan. We, we do the, we, we put them in bags and do the nursery. And the other things which we, we know it's an opportunity also, we do fish farming, which is also good for the women because at least they can they can get their livelihood from it. We also do beekeeping, and the and the county government at least on beekeeping, fish farming. Sometimes they come and uh, they help us. We have organizations which come also to help with this uh, because we've been working with them. They are really helping us, and we have, we have a good opportunity with them. We also have environment department who they come and. And tell us what is going on but in a small way and that is why we are saying there are so many opportunities in our country, especially in the mangrove areas where we can can come up with so many opportunities thank you so much grace uh, for telling us the opportunities that uh, the government have given you the opportunity i see one is something to do with climate change and land restoration is gaining a lot of traction, not even in Kenya, not even in a specific county, but globally. So it is us young people to actually see what are the opportunity which are brought on board. How do I tap into such opportunity? Do I want to raise seedlings? Do I want to do something innovative which gears towards energy conservation, water conservation? Do I diversify my product? So it is us to see it from an, you know, a lens of doing this with all these opportunities whereby I adapt at the same time I enrich my pocket. The second one is what every county is struggling with now to tap into the Flocker Fund. This is a World Bank funded project which targets projects at the county level, but it will trickle down to the world level. That is funding locally led initiative. But it's unless the counties have this appropriate policy and the fund regulation, that is when they can tap into this money. But if your county already has the policy, they have the fund regulation, their house is in order, they have these committees, then we can tap into such opportunity. But if not yet, we can see how we can do proper advocacy so that even within our default system, they can have this appropriate policy. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Milton. Masi, would you like to mention uh, some opportunities that the county government have to, to women? Uh, thank you. In our Forest Act, we have participatory forest management and tree planting is an avenue that is uh, opens uh, so many opportunities. And uh, we have nature-based enterprise. Our communities who are planting trees have uh, have opportunities to put beehives in the forest where they have planted. Uh, we also have been promoting improved uh, energy saving technologies, uh, energy saving GCOS. That is another opportunity that is viable and uh, and that has market people people are now transitioning from charcoal and, and firewood because the, the energy saving GCOS are using uh, a retro of those. And then we also have um, the the private sector, the private sector are funding uh, serious innovations, serious um, 
uh, solutions that can really address issues around uh, restoration. And, 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 and people need to package their proposals in a way that we, it, it will be able to attract the funding. We also have environmental county environmental committees, uh, the, the, the county gazette, those kind of environmental committees, and involvement or appointment of the youth in those particular com com uh, committees can really uh, take them to, to a level where they can inform decisions where, where they are being made. But the most important is uh, for the youth to embrace technology. We have seen during COVID-19, some businesses died because they could not really go online or they could not be able to, to move to the next level. But the youth were able to take up uh, the online platform and they were able to, to move with it. Therefore, even the nature-based uh, enterprises is an area uh, where if we embrace technology, it can help. Babu, Babu is, a, is another avenue that is coming up. It is very powerful. It is good for conservation. It is good for business. And it is an area where we can engage to make different products. And, and the market is opening. We have Babu processing farms. And it's an area that we, we, if we explore and, and people get established in, it can bring a lot of uh, resources and it's an opportunity that is very good uh, to bring resources especially around the youth and women. Thank you so much Mercy. In your own experiences to mention a um, way forward in terms of now enhancing participation of women and youth in decision making processes which are linked to restoration. I'd like to start with you Mercy. I would say one of them is community empowerment and environmental education. It's a powerful platform that brings information to the table that isolates uh, problems, uh, what, are the pro uh, what are the challenges, what are the causes, and what are the, the, the solutions or the actions that community can take. Uh, therefore, that is a very powerful platform that people need to, to use. The other one is exchange visits. We need to, to learn from the best practices, uh, to learn people from those who have had experience. That is an area that needs to be explored again. Change agent. Uh, we have, for many years, we have uh, trainers and of trainers, people who are doing a very good job. They are environmental stewards. We also have green change agents who are, they are like many hats or the many, the foot soldiers who take the good news to, to other community member so that we can be able to spread the message. Uh, those are some of the areas that are, are very, very important, especially around tree planting for restoration. Thank you. Thank you so much, Masi. Uh, welcome, Grace. The first point is they have to be empowered. The empowerment I'm, I'm talking about is about uh, they have to be taught how to engage themselves in these projects. They have very good ideas, but they don't know how to go about them. Uh, we empower them with the education, a little bit of education. I know they, they are not educated as much as others do, but with that little education, uh, if they can be taught how to go around about their projects, it will help them to be taught skills of the different areas which they are working in. And also the platform which my, my colleague was saying about, it's really good because if there's a platform, you know, somebody can just go and see what, what we can do because most of the time people don't know where. To. So if there's a platform, help us as youth and women and also uh, women and youth can be helped in different areas of uh, being recognized also they are not doing much but whatever they are doing if the government can recognize them it will help them also thank you milton i'd like to welcome you please so the first thing we really need to do is to form a network and it should be a vibrant, very young people are agile and they really know what they want to do to engage the duty bearers. Secondly, you need to get, not maybe government idea, but you need to get an insider, someone who can give you information and update you on what next. So you are ever on the hook and you just know next week, this is what is likely to happen and how do we orga really organize ourselves. Having a network, very vibrant one too, with young people and women to engage the duty bearers is a very important thing. And you empower people within your network through capacity building and enhancing their skills so they can even integrate these key documents when it's come to CIDP, ADP, fiscal strategy paper, so they know. So the best, the most important thing is to have a vibrant network and you capacity build people within this network. It can really work. 
Thank you. Thank you so much, Grace and, and Marcy and Milton for all your, for this wonderful discussions. And I'm sure everyone participating in this session has really learned a lot. So next we will we will invite, I would like to invite uh, Damaris. Damaris is uh, is a youth and gender officer at UNEP and she she's going to, to, to take us through to discuss the opportunities for participation, stroke representation of uh, in the international level, such as the UN Decade of Ecosystem Restoration, which is uh, from 2021 to 2030. So Grace, welcome. Thank you very much for this particular opportunity. As you're already aware, and I, I, and I guess because of where we are seated, we are already aware that in our continent, up to 700 million people are predicted to migrate because of land degradation and climate change by 2050. When we say 700 million people, we can already tell which constituency of people we are talking about. And that is why this particular discourse for me is very important. Again, recognizing that restoration through agroforestry alone has the potential to increase food security for 1.3 billion people. Again, when we say it has the opportunity to increase food security for 1.3 billion people in the world, who are we speaking about? I think we already know, and that is why we are having this discourse. And so today I would like to take this opportunity to commend the world leaders who thought of this, whose efforts and progress has been made in articulating the developmental and ecological needs of the world. And that is why then we have the UN Decade for Ecosystem Restoration. While doing all this, we can't forget about the continent where we have the African Union. And out of that, we have the Pan-African Action Agenda on Ecosystem Restoration for Increased Resilience. Now, recognizing that our global world is for ecosystem restoration, recognizing that our continent is for ecosystem restoration, then why women and youth? Why is it so important that we provide opportunities for engagement and continuous action in the decade? So one of the reasons is because the United Nations General Assembly said so. It said that whereas the aim is to support in scaling up efforts to prevent, to halt, and to reverse the degradation of ecosystems, this cannot be done alone. And it cannot just be done with already formal institutions or already state actors. We have to work very closely with non-state actors. In this case, women and youth as constituencies who are key and paramount to this particular decade. Specifically, the United, the United Nations General Assembly said this. It stressed the importance, particularly while preparing and while implementing, it stressed the importance of full involvement of all relevant stakeholders, including women, children, according to their evolving capacities, young people, older persons, persons with disabilities, indigenous peoples, and local communities. And that's why I'm so excited to see what is happening here. The first panel was very exciting because it has brought the, those particular dynamics. And again, Although the UN decade ends, we could say in 2030, we can tell that it aims to create a platform for societies globally to put their relationships with nature on a new tra trajectory. And this is envisaged that this trajectory will include nature being respected across the society. And when we say being respected across the society, who are we talking about? We are talking about the constituencies who are part and parcel of this same nature. And as we already know, women and youth highly engage with these ecosystems. And so ecosystem restoration takes over, we could say, hundreds of millions of hectares if we were to take it up over the next 10 years and will generate it is supposedly going to be generating millions of new livelihoods and who again will be uh, highly engaged in this the women and the youth not forgetting the issue of human rights the issue of gender equity and the issue of introducing and engaging particularly the disabled uh, the people with dis disabilities again a key component in the delivery. Already we are really aware of the statistics from the women's perspective that, for example, women make up 43% of the agricultural workforce in the developing world. And it is estimated that if women had the same access to productive resources as men, they could raise total agricultural output in developing countries by 22.5% to 
12% in turn, reducing the number of hungry people in the world from 12% to 17%. That is big. And that's an opportunity. It is an opportunity we cannot let go. We are 43% women in this case. Moreover, it's been known that women in the forest communities, and I think that is what I've been hearing. I've been hearing from the green, uh, green belt. I've heard from the Narani Conservancy here. And it's becoming clear that women in forest communities may generate more than half of their income from forests. And women are deeply involved in land use across the world and so have to fully be engaged, particularly in forest restoration or landscape restoration. And so how can they be supported to participate? So the UN decade is hoping that one of the things that it will do, it is to inspire. And that is why it's a decade. It is not an event. It is a process. It's a decade where we are going to be, it's a, more, a process of inspiration. And who is this person being inspired? It's just particularly the person in, engaging in this nature uh, space. And in our discourse today, women and youth, where the, it, is, it, is, it is envisaged that the, the support will come in particularly promoting a global movement. And I've had it. I've had the Green Belt movement, movement, uh, movement speaking about it, and hence it's a movement. It's a global uh, Green Belt movement. I've had Milton speaking from the youth perspective, saying we need to form a network. And so, one of the things that the decade is going to push is a movement of people who believe in this one thing for the next ten years for action. And so, one of the things is that there is going to be a promotion of a global movement focusing on restoration. The other thing is, and I think I've had it. This whole morning developing legislation sorry legislative and policy frameworks to incentivize restoration not just restoration incentivizing it why should i be involved in restoration we already know the statistics we already know that we are engaging in this space women and youth but what are we getting out of this if we engaged in restoration. How do we food, put food on the table? How do we incentivize restoration? And then we need to come up with innovative financing. And that's another thing that is going to be pushed within this decade. There's going to be mechanisms to fund operations on the ground. And I've heard about what Milton and what Catherine and what Grace have said. It needs to trickle down. In our case, we are devolved and it's amazing that we have a devolved system. But how does this devolved system in Kenya come down all the way to support people highly engaged in the restoration movement. Not forgetting that we need to restore and care for nature while undertaking science. And again, this is where I want to bring in our narrative. We are young, we are youthful, but we have a mind. We are going to schools. What science research are we bringing on the ground? How do we want to create our landscapes? Do we want to continue using our normal old ways? What's the data? What's the science? And who can develop this? It is us young people. We are the ones who've been taken to school. We are the ones who have been educated to be who we are. And so we need science. And so for the next decade, if someone delves in science, or someone delves in, and someone delves, deals with, we could say, um, research, information will come out so clearly with our current age. One of us said this morning that we need to engage with the digital space that we currently are in. How do we use the div div different digital spaces that have come into place for restoration? Again, I hope that's a thing that out of this decade, we will be able to. And so ideally, it's going to be, I would say, a movement and a movement for the next 10 years for women and youth engaging in the space they've already been engaging it in a different way, building better. So from where I sit, how have youth and women been engaged in framing and shaping the decade as well as how have they been represented and what mechanisms have been put in place to ensure that they continue being engaged and i'm happy to state that for example unep and fao generated the youth strategy and this particular youth strategy wasn't developed by the agencies no it was developed by the youth themselves and this strategy came out around a you know, it was a youth paper for ecosystem restoration and the strategy itself, which actually exists and someone here needs to look for it so that you can implement it in the country. The strategy elaborated the need and intention to actively engage youth groups through a section called partnering with youth. And that is why you see that as with the decade is going on, this constituency of people, the youth is not being left behind because it was clear that this is a very big constituency of people who need 
to be engaged. And so it invited people, particularly uh, in our case, uh, uh, youth who are involved in the children and youth organizations of the major group section of UNEP. And they were highly engaged in a very interactive process in 2019, 2020, done and dust. Amazing. And then in 2020, last year, um, as we were approaching 2021, again, the UN Decade Coordination Group approved the establishment of the UN Decade uh, Ecosystem Restoration Youth Task Force. So there is a strategy, there's a youth strategy, and now there is a process being done as we speak right now for a youth task force. And this task force, what will it be doing? This task force will advise on, you know, it will its role is to advise and facilitate youth engagement in the context of the UN decade. So if you're not part of this, from where you sit, then the context of the UN decade is left out. And what I've, I've seen is that the functions of this particular task force are amazing. There are four, there are not many. They are focusing on policy and advocacy, youth action, space for discussion, and knowledge and capacity building. So how do we institutionalize this again into the, our country? For women, women, and I've had, and I've had what the lady from the Greenberg movement has just said, voices of women. Women have been at this forever. We've done this for so long, our voices just need to get out. The Greenbelt movement was able to bring out Wangari Matau as a voice for nature. But what are we doing now? Where are these voices? And so one of the things that is being hoped is out of this, that there will be an opportunity to provide convening opportunities, funding opportunities, innovative solution opportunities, voices being out there, being heard. And one of the things that came out particularly from just as we were celebrating World Environment Day, there was, or we do have what is called the major groups and stakeholders group within the United Nations Environment Program. And they met as African major group. And this is what they said. One of the key messages, whereas they were very excited about what is happening in the, the decade, what's coming up, they said that women, youth, and non-state actors need to be proactively engaged in the development and implementation of ecosystem restoration policies, projects, and programs. This came from the Africa group. It was a statement made towards World Environment Day when the launch of the ecosystem decade was being launched. And they stated specifically on this and also mentioned that states need to promote co-management models for our ecosystems with communities in order to strengthen ownership. That's again something that came from the Africa major groups. So ladies and gentlemen, our ecosystems, as you're already aware, are in danger, but they can be restored and it will be the collective steps we take that ensure that they are given the space to thrive. And you and I, the women and the youth, I think we are in the heart of this discourse. We cannot turn back time. But we are the generation that can make peace with nature. And this, again, is our final rallying call. It is our chance to set things right. So ladies and gentlemen seated here, the young and the women, let's get active, not anxious. Let's get bold and not timid. And the opportunity is there for us to take action. We have 10 years. It's not an event. It's a process. Thank you very much, June. Thank you so much, Damaris. And as I hope all the youth in here have heard that it's our chance to make peace with nature. And we have 10 years. As, as everyone is draining the breakout room, I would like to uh, really uh, thank the speakers from the first session, from the first plenary, and for sharing your experiences. In case you have any problem, please put it in the chat and then someone will help you join the breakout room. Breakout room number one is about restoration financing. The second one is capacity building. Inclusion of women and youth is the third one. Women leadership in restoration is the fourth breakout room. And the fifth one is networking and restoration communication. So you can just mention you want record one, two, three, or you can just say the name that you'd like to join. Thank you, everyone. Have a very meaningful discussion and participation. Yeah, so thanks everyone. We would be so excited to hear what people are saying in the breakout rooms. Any group that is ready, you can just go. I can start. Let me just share my screen. So we addressed a couple of uh, issues and uh, among them we had uh, uh, challenges. Some of the challenges we got to uh, agree on was access to financing in the devolved governments in that, uh, uh, let me just read and then I'll expound on all of them as I continue. Engaging in budgetary processes planning, lack of proper organization uh, in, with the youth area, financing criteria uh, is too high, like the minimum requirements are too high. Then we had the culture barrier and access to land for actual restoration. So 
uh, with all this, we especially on the financing bit and the budgetary bit, we realize uh, most most of the youth are not involved in these planning processes during the budgetary uh, uh, the, the 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 initial stages of the budgetary uh, pro planning process, and this uh, is a dis disadvantage to us because. Uh, we are not really included because we don't have a representation to actually air out our issues. So they, we, we don't actually get the resources uh, on our end. And lack of proper organization in terms of, um, we don't have, most youth are not like uh, really organized in terms of we don't have uh, proper groups to be able to handle certain issues. And whenever there's funding, we need proper organization. And the financing criteria, you find that especially in like Kenya, the, the minimum requirements are too high. They want groups that um, must have stayed for a really long time. And you find that uh, it does not really capture the youth currently. The culture barrier where we have some women, in certain communities, women are not viewed as uh, proper decision makers. There are places that in the household, in the kitchen, and also access to land for actual restoration uh, whereby most youth currently, they are selling their lands that their, 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 uh, their old people left them in order for them to buy this. And then we end up having a concrete jungle so that uh, land restoration becomes an issue. We have uh, some of the solutions we came up with were capacity building for resource mobilization. That was especially touching on the, the finance criteria where we are able to uh, hold capacity building sessions for these uh, organizations that uh, come up with this criteria so that they may be able to actually capture most of the youth and especially the upcoming ones and lobbying and advocacy for the public. This was more of uh, the mass sensitization talking to the public because like for example when you look at this conference only few of us are able to be represented here while the youth take up uh, major, uh, the major population in the country. So when we talk and make the information go out there and lobby as many people as we can, we'll be able to achieve the set targets that we have. Also, we as youth and women, we need to take initiatives, like be the ones to start these processes and take this approach, not just sit and wait for the older generation to lead us into these solutions. Also, we need to affiliate ourselves with the working and mature network. This uh, was more of like, learning from those that uh, precede us in terms of see how the organizations are working, see what they have been doing and be able to incorporate and even make better while trying to work on these land restoration issues. And also uh, ensure proper organization by forming common interest groups to ensure visibility and register to leverage on the current opportunities. What we noted was uh, most donors when they come, they want things that are already working for them to be able to hop on. So when we have this common interest groups, order, it, it's, it's easier for us to move towards the same direction. Uh, also, uh, in terms of the fundraising, like leading the fundraising bit, we agreed, uh, we, we talked of uh, initiating some programs like the on farming rehabilitation where we have, uh, like for example, the county governments are already offering uh, such funds in this group and their major focus is on youth and women. So we need to rise up and form these programs and start this, uh, initiate the programs ourselves in terms of when you start and then go and ask for funding, they're able to see you've actually started something and it's easier for the county governments to be able to start and be able to fund you. Then we also need to document our success stories to attract donors. Uh, like currently most things are majorly online and virtual. So we need to train uh, the youth and the women on how to do things virtually and document their stories so that to be able to attract more donors and be able to run with this land restoration and within uh, a short period, we'll be able to have achieved our targets. And also uh, as youth and women, we need to team up with various CBOs or maybe form our own groups and register them in order to do proposals and source for funding because everybody wants to take up something that is really, really organized. No one would want to invest in something that they're not sure whether it's going to work or it's not going to work. So that's what we had for the uh, the restoration financing. Uh, back to you. Thanks, Wanda. So uh, the next group. Yes, Kipto. Um, I'm Akini Chantai. I was the moderator for the uh, break room for capacity building. So initially in the beginning, we discussed about the main challenge of who to engage, um, that youth and women need to identify um, the party or 
the institution or also the, the resources that they need in order to capacity build themselves. And also uh, we had to define what capacity building is. For some um, of, our, of our participants recognize this as resources, for others they recognize it as skills, and others also recognize it as lesson res learning resources. So we, had, we also had to confirm and realize that capacity building covers all of this. The other thing that we also discussed that was part of uh, a problem and also a, solu a solution is branding. That a lot of uh, youth groups and women groups do not know how to brand themselves. So we discussed that these skills are needed in terms of digital marketing, personal branding, organization branding, and also skills such as uh, presentation skills, public speaking skills are very essential in that to ensure that. The other discussion that we also had was that for women and youth, especially who, who have uh, certain products or resources that they're presenting either through enterprises or they're doing in uh, maybe presenting or offering within the community, that value addition, addition is something that's very essential. That's something that we realize that value addition, especially for enterprise products, is very essential. And we, uh, women and youth need to learn how to value addition their products. The other requirement was that a um, lot of youth groups and women groups do not know maybe about legal requirements or that are needed. So we, we discussed that it's essential for most groups to register themselves under um, government or legal requirement for re legal requirements, because this can enable them to access funding, to access technical assistance, and also to access and to be recognized by other organizations that would be interested to assist them. The other thing is that they need to learn how to track their impacts. So in terms of tracking their impacts, this is essential for reporting purposes and to also indicate if once they've received this capacity building resource, how will they, um, how will their impact be? How will it double? Did it impact? Did it not? And all. And that learning resources is something that they can easily access, such as online courses. So just to summarize, a few of our participants had brought out really unique ideas such as Milton Sam, Geoffrey and Hans Peter. And one of the best, one of the best that we felt at the end was about mentorship and coaching, that we need to have an intergenerational link between that and that we need to include youth and women into mentorship and coaching, that they can gain experience and professional guidance from those who are more experienced than them. And that also uh, for data and monitoring, masters and PhD students can be, can should be involved in finding ways to assist these groups to have uh, set up data and monitoring operations and how to do that. And also Jonathan had, uh, Jonathan and Sam had highlighted that real-time reporting is very essential for accessing and also being recognized to attain certain capacity building resources. So other than that, that is all from our group. Um, if my group members would like to add anything, please add in the chat section. Thanks. Or any other group that is ready. My name is Emma. I'm, I'm representing group four, the one on progressive youth and women inclusion. So as you were discussing, we got to realize that women play a big, big role when it comes to restoration. And many a times they face challenges together with young people. And some of the challenges they faced is that at the end of the day, you can find that they're involved in labor work. But when it comes to having a say in restoration, it becomes an issue when it comes to getting the title deeds for the land. It becomes an issue when it comes to that. Um, also, another issue that it comes to youth is that they can have the ideas, but they may not be realistic. And uh, many young people are just into getting quick money and they don't see agriculture as a desirable thing to do, of which currently even where we are in, we can see that there's a lot of advantages that comes with um, agriculture, whereby there are a lot of returns that can come in. And also when it comes to restoration, when it comes to the tree growing side, there are also advantages, not only for nature, but also if there are monetary returns, which can be of benefit. But also when we look at the challenges, there also the there's the need for young people to be involved. So one the ways that they can be involved is that there's need for more action. We usually have a lot of meetings, but we need to take 
action at the end of the day. And we, we realize that the youth are the driving force for the economy. Most of our economy is made up of young people. So they need to be included in this conversation. And the young people need to stop limiting themselves by uh, seeing restoration stuff, agriculture stuff as something for people who are unlearned, but rather seeing it as an opportunity whereby they can use it um, to not only work on restoring uh, our earth, but also when there are incentives involved, they can get monetary benefits from that too. And also, I think the last thing I can talk about is that there's need to be equipped with the right information. At the end of the day, information is power. And once you have the information, you can be able to achieve so much, the right information. Thank you. Next group. So our, our group was uh, tackling women leadership in restoration. And uh, the first question is uh, on what support do women need to take on leadership roles in restoration governance space? So we say that capacity building is key. If women do not understand what their role is, what they need to do, and how they can bring in their ideas to address restoration, they would probably not give their best. Then uh, sensitization on leadership. Women need confidence to believe and to take up leadership roles. Communities need to accept women as leaders, especially where we have uh, very conservative cultures. We also need support uh, from groups that uh, make the leading role of women a reality because many women desire to take up these positions. Women also need needs should be put really at a central place, especially in the value chains around nature-based enterprises so that this can scale restoration. The barriers that affect women participation in leadership, including division of uh, labor in the household, access and control over resources, the power imbalances and cultural barriers need to be addressed to make it possible for women to take leadership roles. We also need affirmative action where we intentionally ensure that women are included in the decision-making platforms to ensure there's gender equity. Because if we do not allow women to uh, make decisions pertaining to what ad challenges them or what could provide them opportunities to address restoration, then they do not become effective. We also need the county government to uh, drive this process or to provide the opportunities by uh, enhancing access to resources that empower women to take up these roles. We also want to see more documentation, especially on the inspirational roles of women who have taken leadership in landscape restoration, because this can inspire governments to scale up these uh, practices. We need the county's goodwill to make it easier. We also need to track the number of women participating in projects. If we assume that land restoration activities are going on without uh, inclusion, that means both men and women participating and benefiting, we may not necessarily know whether some people have been lef left out. We also need to rethink uh, time and places, especially as pertaining women involvement or participation in activities. So there are certain types of activities that would automatically bar women from participating and this becomes barriers in them taking up the leadership role. So we need to be more gender sensitive, especially in our programming, in our planning, in our designing of programs. The issue of land tenure system was also emphasized. So we, we know that this is a big barrier, especially in ensuring that women are meaningfully engage and benefit from land restoration activities. So there's need to, uh, address this. The uh, aspect of access to resources in, like loans, so financial uh, resources. So if women want to scale up uh, land restoration activities and they need loans, do banks really understand the space of women and how women can access uh, money to do big projects? Uh, the, 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 the aspect about giving women their own space, especially when trainings are involved to ensure that they're able to you know, understand each other, engage each, each other. And if they have young children, can they come with these children to the training? How sensitive are we in our planning? There are also needs uh, for financial incentives. 
women have a lot of responsibilities at households. So if they do not have additional incentive to participate, which will balance what they needed to do in the house, they may be still bad. Now, the next bit was who should do this? We want men to champion women participation and women leadership in restoration. So if men are not going to be our champions, we are still going to have a problem. We want the government to review its policies to enhance gender equity. We want community structures such as schools and churches to act as role models in a way that advocates and embraces women leadership in, uh, and, and, and engagements. We want women also to champion for women participation and women leadership. If we become enemies of our own selves, if we do not believe in ourselves, we are not going to address the, the barriers that we face and we are not also going to lead restoration like we want. We also need to have grassroots organizations championing this. The media is a powerful tool in creating awareness, changing mindsets. We want to see women in the media propagating restoration and leading restoration. We don't just want to see women used to advertise uh, chewing gum or these kinds of things. We want to see women used in advertisement to show tree planting, driving tractors, because they are able to do this. We want to see research institutions and research in itself being more gender uh, sensitive and packaging the, 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 the findings of research in a way that can be consumed by women. Because otherwise, the research that has been done around gender mainstreaming will not be of value if women do not understand or women are not you know, shared, uh, given this kind of information. Then the last uh, bit was, what should women do to enhance their land restoration actions and spearhead others? So who will provide it? We said women should educate themselves, small steps. We want mentorship programs for women, especially in leadership. We want to <clears throat> see women get monetary support to enhance their ability to participate effectively, more gender responsive policies. Again, we still emphasize on information packaging. Most women, especially at grassroots, are not as educated. So if we make uh, technologies, if we make information around land restoration very sophisticated, we will not be able to tap into women involvement and participation. We want uh, uh, to see restoration activities that reflect women's priorities and their practical needs addressed so that it becomes easy for them to take part. We also have to focus on allocation of resources for women actions. Women cooperatives and groups need to be empowered and strengthened because this is the avenue through which they can be reached effectively. We need support uh, from institutions that stand for the rights of women whenever they are uh, their, their rights are, uh, are, are uh, tampered on. It was interesting to have a few men with us, but they were very active and they said that women need love. Very interesting. We put that on bold because it's that love that gives them the power to, to and strength to sustain their engagements in land restoration. We also want to see more involvement of women in the budgetary processes and uh, the intergenerational gap. Women have rich indigenous knowledge Women have a lot of capacity to nurture children in restoration through storytelling, through songs. And this is where the future has to you know, focus on. How do we tap into these opportunities to ensure that we have a generation that is coming up more empowered, more focused, and more incentivized to participate in restoration? Yeah, that was it from our group. Thank you. Uh, networking on group on the group that we discussed networking and communication uh, we were discussing how we can have this improvement and uh, inclusion towards networking and communication therefore what we came up as a group uh, that we this, we found out that community leadership is a missing gap and women and youth should uh, embrace this you know, knowledge to share it on the grassroots and be the champions on the grassroots so that we can have the normal, you know, understanding from top to bottom knowledge. And then county to county and state to state linkages to have a joint commission for cooperation uh, in its agendas. And this will uh, will encourage our neighbors like Uganda uh, 
Tanzania to have these joint corporations like for agriculture and uh, pass it through our curriculums. And this will uh, will include uh, an ecosystem growth through uh, from local to our neighbors to, uh, to everyone. And uh, student exchange programs through ICT and capacity buildings. Uh, this will uh, will also encourage students to participate, you know, in exchange programs for agriculture, and uh, this will give them exposure to understand different states how they're tackling agriculture or tackling their, you know, their ecosystems, and uh, this will bring youths from different uh, uh, con uh, continents to work together, and the knowledge will be expanded. And also we discussed that implementation and policy development matters uh, to have efficiency and sustainable delivery. Uh, we have realized that imp uh, implementation here in here in back here in Kenya it's a it's a problem and it takes um, forever to you know have these implementations. Therefore, if we can join this uh, this stakeholders and make this implementation become an efficiency and no uh, one is something to be solved immediately that way i think we'll be able to tackle this uh, the gaps and uh, the implementation problems and policy developments that we feel youth and women that we may miss out or our our thoughts are not put in place and then we have mentorship programs in the marine wetlands for the youth and women we discovered that uh there's the marine the marine wetlands areas are are not uh well tackled with everyone therefore if we have the youths and women involved in this participation uh the, this will the knowledge of beekeeping the knowledge of uh the beekeeping and butterfly keeping will be able to be uh, you know uh tapped into it by through women and youth and they will champion it then we also discovered that uh in net through networking and communication we should also have a whatsapp group or you know these for uh, apps that can keep us running and keep us included and keep us in touch therefore this we can use the technology to ease our agendas through through the apps through the whatsapp groups and uh, i believe this way we'll have uh, easy communication and networking and this will build bridges from different state to state and uh, local communities will also be participants farmers and also the small scale farmers and also the students and everyone and the youth and women will also be part part and member of this whatsapp group and then we discovered that uh, we should also join the green belt movement different states that are not members of the join uh, green belt movement should uh, have the mentorship the mentality of joining this why because we if we have this knowledge of you know keeping our, our world green healthy environment clean air it will uh, look for future generations and our kids will grow into clean environment and then the last and last is that we should have a link through local institutions and women and youth should be participants to solve these restoration processes which is a missing up and a challenge that it's faced thank you very much for this opportunity thanks for you so thank you so much for the discussions and everything that you have brought back to the plenary. We're going to be having this for Akini Tektari. My name is Akini Chamtai. I will be a moderator for this second session. Our session today is about restoration opportunities. And we are also going to highly discuss um, opportunities to access financing, capacity building, and networking. Um, what support has your organization been able to access for your activities? And in support, uh, we're defining support here such as funding, technical assistance, provision of equipment, capacity building, access and access to knowledge bases and collaborations. So for first of all, I'll ask Victor since his mic is, uh, his camera is on. Hello everyone, uh, great to be here. My name is Victor Mugo. I am the regional coordinator for the Climate Smart Agriculture Youth Network, uh, which is a network of young people who are engaged in climate smart agriculture. And we really do believe that I, they, there are very many opportunities for young people, especially in the agricultural sector. But if we take context uh, to the changing climate, um, I am also the co-chair to the Youth Liaisons Group of the UN Food Systems Summit. Uh, first, I want to acknowledge that 
the funding landscape, especially for young people, is, is very difficult. Um, and I just want to acknowledge that I've been on the receiving end, applying for funding, <clears throat> but also being on the other side where uh, I was part of a committee um, that was providing funding uh, to, to youth organizations. Um, and, and the first thing that I wanted to acknowledge is that there's very little funding for uh, youth uh, priorities um, and, and youth within uh, the conservation space, within the restoration space, within the agricultural space. Um, and so what we need to do first is to increase the pool of funding that is available uh, for young people. Um, there are very many uh, opportunities that are there um, that say we, you, youth and women are highly encouraged. I would say uh, that's, that's the same case uh, with me. Um, it took us about three years uh, to get a host who could be able to host uh, the organization, the Climate Smart Agriculture Youth Network. Um, and after that, it took us about three more years to get our first grant um, that we could be able to uh, and, and engage in. Uh, and so uh, from then, then we've been able to receive um, quite a number of, of support uh, structures from different organizations um, in terms of organizational development, in terms of um, business modeling, um, in, in terms of documenting our success stories, in terms of diversifying our sources of funding, and in terms of monitoring and evaluation and impact uh, tracking. Um, so that's what I wanted to say uh, as a start. Thank you very much, Victor, on that. I would also like to uh, gain some insights from Kamau on the same question. Kamau, how has millennial environmentalists gained uh, support, financial assistance? James Kamau here. I'm a conservation biologist, uh, the chairman of the millennial environmentalist. Uh, glad to be here. Thank you, Akin. So, our uh, great support has been the human resource because we've gotten a lot of support for youth in different professions, those that are the best. Uh, the middle of uh, I've gotten support from uh, also other conservation organizations such as the Alliance, the they have come to our aid in teaching us that nurseries are own nurseries, and from the education, we've actually gone down and created our own system where we go uh, from for the younger generation to schools, donate 100 trees, to put trees to different. Uh, we also engage the small, the whole school in collecting food seeds from their home. They collect them, they bring to school, and you know, Kenya schools was Kenyan public schools for six And uh, we actually have started nursery so we that we can actually keep grow the seeds in seed level. Siblings to plant and actually our uh, food trees we can actually enjoy the seeds that we have already grown. Uh, in the community, we also have gotten support because uh, most of our community is the community in Loitoktok, Magad, Nasati here, who is partnered with her also. She's uh, the head of an organization that actually has helped us in actually uh, piercing or actually getting the community level. So, apart from that, uh, our biggest support also has been the online, online, that is uh, the same right, where we get a lot of information. And distributed from across the country, what other organizations are doing. So, those are the most resources that we use currently. Thank you. Thank you very much. Kamau is Issa Mohammed. Hi, my name is Issa Mohammed, founder and CEO of Isiolo Conservationist Trust, a youth led community based organization that works here in Isiolo County. Uh, in terms of like financial support, uh, we got a small grant from an organization, a partnering organization called Ubumbuzi Africa, and uh, that actually led us to come up with a tree nursery. And that was also a starting point of an organization when we are young as an organization. And the, the, the small grant made us to start and think different ways. And that's why we came up with tree nursery. And we have been selling trees to to get some some resources, financial aspect of it. And uh, thank you to that organization. And that was only the small grant that we received yet so far uh, after starting two years ago. And uh, as Victor said, uh, in terms of youth and women funding, we are at the tail end always and having the minimal information when it comes to uh, funding uh, initiatives and also the cor corruption part of it. A lot of people are coming up with different youth organizations just to benefit themselves. And with all that aspect, that poses a challenge to some of the grassroots youth and women organizations to actually 
uh, stand up and get this funding. The other thing is human resource. As human resource, we have uh, Ichiolo Conservationist Trust, Friends of ICT, and uh, I am happy to have, you know, uh, Kipto Chemur, who is uh, one of ICT friends, and he actually helped us in terms of information relay, in terms of, you know, partnership and everything. So those are the resource, human resource that we have, and a lot of partnering and, you know, same-minded, uh, youthful organization that we have across uh, the country. The other thing is about moral support, because uh, the communities here sees our action in terms of implementation and uh, activities, and they always give us the moral support as one of the panelists uh, uh, stipulated. The other thing is about uh, the, 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 the thing that we, we can say is the social media. And uh, as youth organization, youth led organization, we have that social media plus where uh, the unheard voice, our unheard voice at the grassroots level uh, in terms of being at the Northern Kenya, where everyone sees, you know, uh, the rangeland uh, as one of the one of the places that uh, the resources are untapped and uh, the opportunities are minimal. And social media has really played a big role in terms of amplifying our voice. The other thing is, as an innovative way, we are having uh, this initiative called uh, Youthful Conversation on Conservation, where we we take people to, to the uh, national reserves. And uh, in that, we have also tried to have some small income on matters of you know, uh, doing our activities. And with that, we have been able to do uh, the discussion on matters of landscape restoration, on matters of you know, environmental change, uh, climate change, and everything. And at the same time, we have been able to make, uh, make the connecting use to nature. And that was how we have been able to facilitate our activities on the ground. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for that insight. So I'll just go back to Victor. How did you become aware of such opportunities and what ways can you recommend women and youth to be aware of them? Um, th th thank you, Akinyi, for, for that question. Um, one of the things that I realized from a very long time uh, is, is the importance of networking. Um, and I really like the points from the networking session um, that really talks about how we can be able to work together. Um, so for many of the opportunities that I've received, especially because I'm in the agricultural sector, um, there's a digital platform called Nourishing Africa that provides um, information on the latest opportunities, um, the latest uh, resources that are available at the funding um, opportunities are also available. And so I really have benefited much from being just a member of, of this digital platform. Um, so we are able to also get in touch with um, different organizations, um, other agripreneurs uh, within the agricultural space. Um, and then through that uh, process, there's been a creation of, of solutions together. Um, so I really think that it's really possible for us uh, to get into such spaces and also create such spaces so that young people can become uh, aware of the opportunities that are there within uh, the agricultural landscape, but also within the uh, restoration landscape as well. Um, so the other thing that I would want to mention um, is uh, aligning yourself, I think, with um, different priorities by, let's say, uh, the, the UN decade uh, of ecosystem restoration. Uh, so for us, um, what we did uh, was to align ourselves with the food systems uh, transformation uh, that, that is going on at the moment. Uh, so there's really a big push uh, by different stakeholders from member states, from the private sector, that we need to transform more food systems uh, so that we can be able to um, uh, engage well. And, and also that food systems really contribute towards the greatest um, uh, contribute, ha have the greatest contribution towards, uh, say, climate change and, and, and the likes. Uh, so what we've done is align ourselves with um, such uh, agenda and start strategies. Uh, and, and while we are aligning ourselves, we tend to think that we get uh, more networks within the space. We tend to think that we get more opportunities within the space. Uh, and through that, then we can be able to access um, the kind of resources and opportunities that we uh, do require. So those are my two thoughts. Thank you so much, Victor, for that. That's great to hear. Um, Issa Mohamed, how do you network with other actors engaging in similar activities? Yes, please. Uh, we, as an organization, uh, became aware of uh, the uh, relevant opportunities is that uh, from the every connections, from every meetings, seminars, and engagements that we go, can we find a better way of uh, 
making it a vibrant and uh, opportunity uh, opportunity oriented connections because you find a lot of youth organization and women groups uh, going to different engagement and discussions but again they don't make the, the connection that is actually needed in terms of resource kind of it and the other thing is uh, also increasing the area of scope you know we need to increase our our thinking perspective in that uh, we don't think only locally but also nationally and internationally because our view in terms of like resources need not only to be a county level but also at national level and also again uh, but again at international level and uh, the, the the third thing the third thing i can say is also about we need to align ourselves to the movement similar movement for example i can uh, point out one of the best uh, movements that I have been part of as an organization is, is uh, the Kenya Environmental Awareness Network, uh, the key network, because this pulls youthful ideas together, youthful movements together, and this can actually amplify the kind of work that we actually doing on the ground. And that is uh, what I urge more uh, organization, youthful and women organization uh, to feel part of the movement in the landscape or even at national level and even at, at international level, so that what we're actually doing on the ground can be visible uh, in terms of global perspective and in terms of national perspective. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lisa, for that. So Sabina, can you tell us about yourself, about your initiative, and also um, what ways have you been able to integrate local knowledge into your activities? Yes, I'm Sabina Tieno from Mama Bay County founder of Nyatotoruma Women Group, Trina Sari Operator. We train communities on land restoration through regreening approaches, how to establish tree nursery establishment, how to do farmer managed natural regeneration and evergreen agriculture. This helps to, uh, this helps on land restoration by scaling up to reverse our land degradation. We take uh, video clips, do editing, then showcase in the community so that women and youth should know more about um, environmental conservation. Or in addition to that, community members was engaged during the Green Alpha project when they came, they organized trainings in the communities such that we go to villages, train women and youths, also attending events under the seed plant. Thank you so much for introducing yourself and adding points to your insights on the on the question. Um, and something that is essential to also with our current times, which is COVID. What ways have you been able to adapt in terms of accessing financial platforms? or what way or modify your activities to the new normal? Yes, come on. Ah, thank you. Thank you very much. Apologies. Uh, the light went off. My wife and went off. Uh, but then, uh, for me, uh, for us as PME, we have actually married uh, a way of thinking. A way of thinking that today you have to have only three steps. This or three steps is action. The other step is your behavior. Or habit and the other portion is knowledge. Uh, earlier I told you that it's collective. So we are starting with behavior from home. COVID has locked down people at their homes and they cannot move. So for us, with the biggest action you're doing is what can you do in your home? For us, what we are telling people, our members, our friends to do is every time you eat a seed, do not eat a The traditional way of storing seed, you never, you never use to do this. Uh, how it but this day when you put it as in the seeds, popcorns, avocados, and in Kenya we have different seasons, so you find a whole month the amount of mangoes. You can collect so many mango trees, but we are on home, but we are perfect, and uh, we show you on how you can um, use them. Uh, we also have people who are collecting uh, milk packets, and milk packets use them at seedling uh, bugs for our nursery. So you can collect milk packets, you don't hope you can collect seeds. At your very home around, you have soil. You can plant seeds in the seedling buckets. And then after a month, 
we find our members uh, when we go to a school, one member is coming to ten siblings, which he, he or she has been taking care of using their home. And this, uh, so that you can know, is being done at the balcony in Nairobi, no land, no land. So uh, during our COVID uh, uh, situation or time, we had actually to uh, advance the way we take our uh, The other step is the habit. You have to be, have, have, have a discipline that every day we eat a mango or a avocado, have to cut properly first, have to ensure that it's not damaged. And you have to preserve it for some time and look at it. And that is a daily habit that you do. Every time you do you cook tea in the morning, don't throw the, the bag in the dust. It's a very simple thing. You have to take, a, take up some habits change in your life uh, yourself. And then the other big, the last step is knowledge. Now, when I have a seed, I have, have a very good habit for the seed. The knowledge that I have to be, where can I plant it? How can I plant it? And even more knowledge is where, where can I donate the seed? We have people donating acacias in Nairobi National Park. We did a drive of 10,000 siblings in Nairobi National Park to rehabilitate areas that were affected by the estuary. 300 of the seed of the of the of the seed uh, of the seedlings from the 1,000 because we did them in different places came from our members, different people who have planted acacias, people who just love nature trees and when they walk they walk with the forest they love collecting seeds, yeah, to experiment and you can use this in your balcony, home garden, even people are just planting them on containers, plastic bottles that you could normally throw away, you put in soil, you put a seed and after some time it grows. And that brings up uh, a culture that you're trying to instill in the community. Thank you. Thank you very much, James. So I can see that we have a few questions. So one of the questions is, okay, uh, one of the questions is what ways can we support uh, youth and women in terms of accessing um, funding, accessing support and technical assistance, especially those who are not able to access internet or do not have access to digital platforms as you've mentioned um thanks so much uh Akini. um and uh, unfortunately um the, the funding landscape right now has not gotten to the level where we can say the grassroots youth uh, can be able to receive them um, if they are not able to um put themselves out there, uh, especially on social media uh, or, or on different platforms. Um, and no matter how much I, 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 we've tried, especially with our members within the Climate Smart Agriculture Youth Network, we've, we've noticed that um, we can try to supplement uh, the areas in which we can get uh, our sources of funding, but, but still uh, um, the, the digital space is really, um, will continue to run uh, how we are, and be able to determine how we are able to get uh, funding. So, for example, um, I have noticed, for example, uh, that young people who are able to use social media to showcase what they are doing uh, on 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 uh, during uh, this COVID period, uh, the farming activities that they are doing, the restoration activities that they are doing, then they are able to find more traction. So, you, for example, some of the opportunities that we received are just because I posted myself out, out there on, on social media doing what I do, and then saying that, for example, I, I require support. Um, then, for example, such a platform such as this, uh, this webinar, then you are not able to access some of the funding opportunities here and some of the insights that we've received if we are not um, on social media. So what I would really encourage is how do we use our social media? Um, and that could be, I think, uh, the greatest question for us as young people to ask ourselves. What type, what are we doing on social media? Um, there are very many activities that we can engage in, but uh, are those activities profitable really so that they can be able to extend us uh, to receive the kind of support that we do require? Um, so I really hope that uh, we can we can take this challenge and, and use um, social media uh, well so that we can be able to uh, get some of these opportunities. Um, and lastly, I, I know that you mentioned uh, about uh, COVID, uh, and because I'm in the agricultural space, I, I think uh, those people, young people who are in agriculture, I think were the biggest beneficiaries of COVID. Because guess what did not stop during COVID? People did not stop eating. And um, if, if there's something that is quite constant is, is that we require two or three meals every single day. And so uh, what I have seen 
especially during the COVID period, is young people going back to agriculture. So they do not need to be told that uh, agriculture is sexy, agriculture um, is, is, is the new big thing. Uh, is because you can see the economic benefits that come from engaging yourself uh, in agriculture. So uh, there's a research that has been done uh, that shows that uh, young people who are engaged in uh, the food systems were able to receive $27 more than the average person who was uh, not engaging in food systems. And so we can see that um, those who are in agriculture, I think, uh, while the biggest beneficiaries, they are able to continue with uh, their, their economic livelihoods. And they, uh, most of them were not really affected, even with the COVID disruptions. Thank you very much, Victor. So Issa, I would just want to ask you the last final question is, what, would, what insights would you recommend for those who are looking for funding, for those who are, uh, are also in need of technical assistance, what piece of advice would you give them? Thank you, Akini, for that uh, question. And uh, I have two responses for that. And uh, one is, can we also invest in proposal writing? You know, a lot of people are talking about how to get funding. But again, in terms of proposal writing, youths and women groups are, are not into that aspect of proposal, a good proposal writing. And uh, in terms of proposal writing is, can we write an action-oriented proposals? Not proposals that are only on papers, but the proposals that are doable in terms of action on the ground. Uh, number two is also to the funders. Can we make the funding process be simpler? Because uh, as youth and women groups or organizations, we find it tiresome to sometimes apply for this funding, uh, funding because the process is tiresome. The process needs a lot of you know, uh, input in terms of information. And this makes, you know, some people to deter and, you know, sit back and say, you know, we are not uh, uh, able to uh, process for that funding process. Yeah, I, I wanted just to add on the whole aspect of, you know, youth and women in restoration. And uh, the first point is, can we redefine for ourselves the meaning of restoration to our youth and women? Because as youth, we actually think restoration is for uh, the illiterate people. Restoration is tiresome. And can we find a way of redefining uh, the word and the meaning of a restoration. The second one is, can we use the indigenous knowledge also as part of, you know, as well as we are talking about the, the digital platforms and everything, can, because restoration is time bound and can we use the indigenous knowledge? The other thing is involvement of organizational setup. Where when you look at a lot of organization, you know, you can't find youth and women in their, in their organizational structure. Can we, as an organization, have uh, a look at these gender quality issues and the youth being involved? Also, can we make restoration fun? Because we are talking about involving men, uh, youth and women in this aspect of you know, restoration action. But unless we make these action and activities fun for youths and women, uh, we can't get anywhere because uh, because people conserve and restore what they only love because and unless we make a restoration be fun and uh, can involve and bring on board a lot of youths in terms of uh, fun and activities, uh, we believe like as an organization, as a youth led organization, we can't do an action that youths and women are not fan of. The other thing is amplifying uh, the, the, the restoration the unheard restoration voices at the grassroots level. Because when we tag along, when we amplify the voices that are really doing action-oriented, you know, uh, restoration activities, uh, the doers of those actions, you know, get proud of themselves and get hope. And this actually becomes the success story to the next generation and the younger uh, and children and everything. So. That is my last point, and let us be action oriented. Let us not talk of restoration on papers, and but restoration on the actual ground. And remember, people conserve and restore what they love. So make the youth and women love restoration and find it easy of doing. Thank you. Thank you, Issa, for that very powerful last, rem uh, last remark. Other than that, I would like to thank our panelists. I would love to thank Th uh, Victor. I would love to thank Sabina. Uh, Isa and also Kamal for very insightful um, thoughts and also sharing the opportunities on the chat. So I'll pass over to Mika to give us our summary and vote of thanks. And thank you all. And Mika, over to you. Thank you, Chemutai. And sorry, I can see that there are hands up and there are more comments, but I think we have 
reach the end of our time. So we're going to have to go to closing, but please keep using the chat if you have more comments or you would like to make more connections. So just um, a, few, a few observations from my side and then some closing remarks. This has been a really interesting session from my side. Um, so many diverse perspectives, great panelists, really great breakout room, even with the interruptions and very, very good insights. So I think we've heard these words a few times around moving to action. And I think at this point, it would be good to reflect on what is today and what we can take forward. So there were some key points that, that I heard very much around participation. So the role of counties and how that could be extended even beyond what is already taking place and particularly around communication and the participation processes. The need for much, much more support for bottom up processes and ensuring that what we're communicating to the grassroots is in a language and in a form that is useful for them. Incentives, we've heard a lot about the livelihood opportunities, the need for investment uh, around land tenure, research, not only in the skills for that, but also in the criteria and processes. So how are we working with donors to make sure that we're understanding what sort of resource mobilization opportunities could be made available for youth and women. And then around networks, capacity building, communication. A call for a vibrant network of youth. So we've heard of some platforms that exist and we've also heard of, of the call for more platforms. So I hope that we can start building out those digital platforms. The need for capacity building, for information, a change in mindset and the need for media and their role in that. Um, to document youth and women engagement and their leadership. So we've seen a number of people explain that they have opportunities. And so how can we make sure that we're capturing those shares and using our social media in effective ways? So as mentioned, my name is Mika Borna Cheng and I'm managing the Regreening Africa program, which works across eight countries. But as Regreening Africa, we would also like to support some of these efforts. So post this conference, we could networking sessions to develop more concrete actions. We would also like to capture more of these success stories and share those through social media and websites. And we could also support in making sure that information is more accessible. Now on Friday, this group will present back to all of the other thematic sessions, to the, the private sector, to the donors, to um, our politicians around what clear actions are we going to take forward? So as you're logging out, can I ask everyone to type into the chat what they are willing to contribute, either what they're willing to lead, what they're willing to participate into, what they're willing to support and ideas that they have. So please in the chat, write what you're willing to lead so that this can be presented. We have some key recommendations, but what is our action plan going forward? So I think this has been an incredibly mm -hmm. Um, useful conversation and very, very inspiring. So thank you so much. I hope you all enjoy the rest of the conference and we look forward to seeing more suggestions in the chat as we go forward. So thank you very much to all the moderators and the participants and we look forward to meeting up even after the conference. Enjoy the rest of the day, everybody. Thank you. Mm -hmm.